When Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the young dynamic chief engineer of the Great Western Railway, built Templemead Station in 1841, Bristol took its rightful place on the Great British Railway map. Initially, his main challenge had been to connect London, more specifically, the capital's Great Western Paddington Station, with the then very active port of Bristol, providing a straight level route that could be travelled at speed. Having achieved this, naturally he wanted a station that reflected the company's growing stature as it rapidly expanded to open new lines throughout the south of England and Wales. The Great Western Railway, with its beautiful green and gold livery, certainly had a style all its own, and much of this was due to Brunel's dramatically grand ideas. A more recent admirer of Great Western, the Reverend Wilbert Audrey, creator of Thomas the Tank Engine, said, There are two ways of running a railway, the Great Western way and the wrong way. Brunel would have wholeheartedly approved, because although he was only 27 years old when he was appointed chief engineer, he was not afraid of innovation, and he quickly set a high standard of performance at Great Western. Even today, there are those who interpret the GWR insignia as God's wonderful railway. One of the major differences between Brunel, GWR and the other railway companies was the width of the track used. Since the first railway, the Stockton and Darlington, opened in 1825 with the great George Stevenson as chief engineer, the width, or gauge as it was known, was 4 foot 8 inches. This was because the first carriages used on the railway were horse-drawn, so Stevenson had collected together 100 carts from the neighbouring countryside, measured the widths and taken the average, 4 foot 8 inches, which was termed as narrow gauge. Brunel, by contrast, used his developing engineering skill to define the most efficient width of track, which he calculated at 7 feet, and this was termed as broad gauge. With new railway companies arriving on the scene, the different gauges soon became a problem, where stations needed to cater for both and even Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were inconvenienced by having to change trains. Stevenson was asked for his opinion, and his answer was simple. Make them all the same. They may be a long way away from each other now, but they'll all be joined up one day. Looking at the modern-day computer screens at Temple Meads, flashing up arriving and departing trains from all over the country, it's easy to appreciate just how right Stevenson was. When a Royal Commission was set up by Parliament in July 1845 to settle the issue, Brunel was convinced that his scientifically designed broad gauge would prove its superiority and win the day. The narrow gauge supporters didn't question the validity of broad gauge, but argued that as it was in the majority in terms of route mileage, it should be the preferred width. The government agreed, and although initially Brunel was allowed to keep and extend his broad gauge on the GWR for a limited time, all new companies had to use the width of the old farm carts, which changed its name from narrow to standard gauge, and of course, is still in use today. This was desperately disappointing for Brunel, and sadly it wouldn't be the only occasion when Brunel's great engineering skill would fail to gain the recognition it deserved. Brunel, as is evident from this incident, had a very high opinion of his work for Great Western, and he certainly designed Templemead Station on a grand scale. He opted for a Tudor-style facade, screening the train shed, accommodating two platforms with a siding between them. This was then covered by a wooden hammer-beam roof of medieval style, spanning an incredible 72 feet. The station has been modernised on a number of occasions, but this shed has been preserved as a monument to the early years 
of the railway age. The interior of the station was styled fashionably, using Gothic revival, completing the stylish station in keeping with Brunel's rather elegant vision. Temple Meads may have been instigated as a terminus, but before it had even opened, the Bristol and Exeter Railway had begun to run trains to the south. The company had no station of its own, and for convenience built their offices to the right of the main station in Jacobean style. This was not difficult, as the Bristol and Exeter was also running on broad gauge track. The Bristol and Gloucester Railway had the same advantage, and soon became the third railway to share Temple Meads. After opening for business in 1844, the Bristol and Gloucester was quickly swallowed up by the Midland Railway the following year. This was a wonderful opportunity for the Midland, as it had been trying to force its narrow gauge into Bristol for some time. After considerable opposition from Great Western and substantial legal argument lasting nine years, the Midland finally succeeded in 1854. The extra volume of trains soon meant that the station needed to expand and permission was granted in the Bristol Joint Station Act of 1865. However, a clause was added that there was to be no interruption of traffic while the work took place. Needless to say, this made the task considerably more difficult and it took until 1876 the year that the Bristol and Exeter amalgamated with GWR to complete the work. In true Victorian style, the facade became very ornate and decorative, and Brunel, who had died in 1859, would have been delighted with the magnificent new train shed, described at the time in glowing terms, the roof consists of an immense span without a single column, braced together by a series of iron suspension rods and arched girders. Its extreme lightness of lofty, curvilinear character gives it a graceful appearance. Although Bristol Temple Meads is now a very hectic and bustling station, there are still elements from Brunel's day to be found, and as a result, the great romantic nostalgia of a golden railway age is very much alive and well. This makes Temple Meads the perfect place to begin a train journey south to Plymouth, looking at the wonderful history of the Great Western, the magnificent work of Isambard Kingdom Brunel, and of course, the beautiful countryside through which this very special railway runs. There's a strong connection between Bristol and Brunel, and prior to departure, it's worth taking a minor detour to visit Clifton Suspension Bridge and the SS Great Britain, both magnificent examples of Brunel's unique engineering ability. When Brunel first addressed the problem of building a bridge over the Avon Gorge, he was just 24 years old, and he had little experience of bridges. Having a famous engineering father, Sir Mark Isambard Brunel, no doubt aided the young man in terms of credibility. The bridge company certainly consulted Brunel Sr. about his son's ambitious designs for a suspension bridge. Sir Mark had trained Isambard himself and was keen to help with this major project and Brunel Jr. was formally appointed to design and construct the Clifton Suspension Bridge in March of 1831. 168 years later, Brunel's bridge still carries people across the Avon Gorge. The elegant beauty of construction remains to grace the powerful landscape and more recent structural tests show the bridge's strength to be as trustworthy as Brunel had predicted. It was an ambitious project, and its progress was halted due to lack of funds. Brunel never saw its completion, as he died five years before it was opened. 
but the Clifton Suspension Bridge will forever be remembered as one of Brunel's finest achievements. Bristol Dock is the next port of call in search of the SS Great Britain, the first iron-built steamship to be screw-propelled across the Atlantic. Perhaps it was Brunel's father's connection with America that had set him thinking about crossing such a vast ocean. Sir Marc Brunel was born in France and had fled from the French Revolution to New York in 1793 before travelling on to England where he met Isambard's mother. Equally, it could have been the effect of the Industrial Revolution on transport and trading that led Brunel, in his capacity as chief engineer of the Great Western, to investigate ways of developing a steamship route between Bristol and the New World. His first ship was actually called the Great Western, launched in 1837, and the Great Britain was launched in 1843. After a remarkably varied career, including 80 years as a service hulk in the South Atlantic, the city of Bristol was delighted to welcome the SS Great Britain home, where she has proved to be a very popular tourist attraction. Arriving at Temple Meads to catch an early train to Plymouth finds the station busy with both travellers and workmen. Brunel's carefully preserved wooden train shed now offers protection for users of the car park and on entering the building there are still many examples of Brunel's original interior designs. The train pulling into Platform 6 may not be as beautiful as the fine steam locomotives of days long gone, but it is at least on time. There's still a definite sense of expectation and excitement as the carriage doors slam shut, the guard's whistle blows and the train starts moving. landscape changes very quickly, not surprising considering the speed of up-to-the-minute intercity trains and the high banked cuttings soon give way to the green fields and farmland that the west of England is famous for.
For many people, much of the nostalgia associated with Great Western is as a direct result of it being the main tourist route during the heyday of the British holiday industry. As a trend, the seaside holiday had developed rapidly through the 1930s. Billy Butlin opened his first holiday camp in 1937, and in the years after the Second World War, once the beaches had been cleared of mines, the seaside became an increasingly popular destination. It was still a time when cars were scarce, so throughout the summer the GWR lines to the southwest became amazingly busy. As Saturday was the day that everyone began and finished their holidays, from late on a Friday evening, things got very hectic at stations all along the line in preparation for up to eight trains an hour full of holiday makers that would be passing through during the next day. At the same time, there'd also be the same number of trains taking passengers home, returning from the southwest. Each service had a dozen coaches apiece, and there was always a restaurant car to feed the thousands of travellers used to regular meals. Separate Saturday timetables were printed, and although the staff of GWR prided themselves on their superior efficiency, delays were inevitable, particularly when the railway twisted and turned along the coastline. By the late 1950s, cars were becoming accessible to more and more people, and 1958 was in fact the last year when over half the visitors to the West Country came by train. The 1960s and 70s also saw a growth in the popularity of foreign travel, and the British seaside holiday went into decline. Fortunately, some seaside resorts have kept their identity, and despite the inevitable growth of amusement arcades, Western Supermare has maintained its traditional reputation for as much sun, sea and sand as the British beach holiday can hope to provide. The first stop on today's journey is Taunton, the county town of Somerset, and as the train rushes through the many small stations along the way, it's hard to imagine how slow this journey would have been if the Railways Act of 1844 had still applied. This Act stated that each railway company had to run at least one train in each direction daily, stopping at every station, travelling at a rate of at least 12 miles per hour at a charge of a penny a mile. These were known as parliamentary trains, and they were notoriously slow. The fare was obviously more economical than first or second class travel, and much to the disgust of the railway companies, there was often a mixture of classes using these trains. As today's train pulls into Taunton, precisely 37 minutes after leaving Temple Meads, perhaps it could be said that the modern traveller doesn't always appreciate how much the railway service has improved. The landscape along this line has changed dramatically since Brunel's day. The brick-built industrial properties, which quickly sprang up to benefit from the transportation offered by the railway, have given way to vast prefabricated industrial units, out-of-town megastores, 
garden centres and land-hungry housing estates swallowing up vast tracts of countryside. The unmistakable yellow of the rapeseed fields and hazy blue linseed crops have become prolific additions to Somerset's world-famous cider orchards and rich, fertile pasture land. The next stop is Tiverton Parkway, eight minutes after Taunton. Close by, the station at Tiverton Junction was the site for a story reported in the Railway Herald of 1890, which typified the pride and dedication to duty of the GWR railway man. An elderly lady on a train that was about to pull out of the station called to a porter to retrieve the sixpence that she'd dropped onto the line. Conscious of the importance of the train leaving on time, the porter handed the lady a sixpence from his own pocket, explaining that he would pick up the coin when the train had cleared the station. The poor man was very disappointed when all he managed to find was a bent old threepenny bit for all of his trouble. To full speed, today's train flashes through Stoke Cannon Station, a junction connecting this line with the X Valley Railway which closed to passengers in June 1960. Many a holiday maker to the West Country before that time would have remembered the name of Stoke Cannon, as it was where the waiting trains were held on busy summer Saturdays, hit by inevitable delays going in and out of Exeter.
Exeter St David's is a fine station, which still has a flavour of great western elegance both inside and out. Fortunately, today's journey has encountered no delay, taking only 7 minutes from Stoke Cannon, making the total time taken so far from Bristol Temple Meads a speedy 1 hour and 6 minutes. This station imposes its presence over a fairly large area, with the Great Western Hotel, which would have offered many travellers a welcome resting place, flanking it to the left. The restaurant and bar is actually called Brunel's, which is about as close to a memorial to the great engineer that has yet been seen since Temple Meads. The platforms here are also spacious, with a recently applied coat of green and gold paint on the fine wood and metal fixtures, providing a perfect setting for those meeting loved ones, bidding others farewell, and for the train spotters happily prepared for an exciting day with camera and notebook. Travelling through the Somerset and Devon countryside, the herds of cows grazing alongside the railway are as important a part of the nation's milk production as in Brunel's day. Today's farmers may have to contend with European community directives and milk quotas, but in the past, transporting milk by rail without the benefit of refrigeration evidently brought its own problems, and the GWR staff guidebook, which does make fascinating reading, contained some very sensible advice. Milk should be placed as far as possible in the shade. Care must be taken to stand the trolleys so that they will be well clear of the open doors of incoming and outgoing trains. The thought of milk churns flying down the station platforms after being hit by opening train doors seems comical, but it's highly probable that these wise words were recorded for posterity after a messy accident with rather a lot of spilt milk. Leaving all thoughts of dairy farming behind, the passengers of today are treated to a fine view of Exeter as the train pulls out of the station, passing the beautiful 12th century cathedral on its high vantage point, marking the beginning of the most stunning part of this journey. As the estuary of the River X widens, it becomes more and more certain that the first sight of the sea is not far off. By the time the train rushes through the little station at Starcross, about 10 minutes after leaving Exeter, the sea stretches out invitingly to the left-hand side. Caravan parks have covered large areas of the countryside, and as the train rumbles through Dawlish Warren Station, which has undoubtedly seen better days, the traveller has definitely moved into seaside holiday country.
the curving railway track following the edge of the coast has by this time slowed the pace of the train, giving the passengers an opportunity to see the stations through which they are travelling. Within minutes, the red cliffs on one side and the sea on the other carry the train into Dawlish. The town may of course look more attractive in bright sunshine, but with the station signal box displaying a prominent to let sign, and many of the Regency seafront houses looking to be in need of renovation, the whole atmosphere is rather dilapidated. Dawlish was once a fine holiday resort, and its most famous visitor was perhaps the great English novelist Jane Austen in 1802 who often extolled the virtues of seaside society in her novels. The lady herself is said to have had a secret romance with a gentleman she met at the seaside, which may of course explain her obvious fondness for the sea in her writing. If the townscape at Dawlish is disappointing, the fabulous scenery and the remarkable railway engineering at this point on the line are most definitely not. The sandstone rock formations are certainly arresting, and as there are five tunnels in quick succession, the blinking eyes adjusting to extremes of light and dark see the landscape through a dramatic perspective. The sea wall between Dawlish and Tynmouth is as beautiful today as it ever was. It's perhaps not quite seen in its full glory with the tide out, but it's without doubt a lasting example of the innovative railway engineering practiced by Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Tynmouth is the next station and the last seaside resort pass through before the train turns back inland towards the next stop at Newton Abbott. The town of Tynmouth is the largest of these seaside resorts along this outcrop of coast and its prosperity grew from its importance as a shipping port for the distribution of Dartmoor's clay and granite. The harbour is still in use, and as a holiday resort, the town attracts many visitors throughout the summer season. Once away from the coast and its winding railway tracks, the train seems to pick up speed again, and within a few minutes it pulls past the Newton Abbott racecourse into this still busy but attractive station. There are some old railway buildings, but it's evident that many older buildings have been demolished. Newton Abbott became an important station in the 1840s, and trains from here would either branch off to the English Riviera resorts of Torquay and Paynton, and further on to Dartmouth and Kingsweir, or continue, as is the case today, on to Plymouth. Newton Abbott was also the location for another of Brunel's great experiments. As an engineer, Brunel had been impressed with the atmospheric railway system, which operated by plates passing under a continuous leather flap to pistons in an iron pipe laid between the rails. Pumping engines were then placed at intervals along the line, which could then create a vacuum inside the iron pipe. This in turn would draw along the pistons, which enabled the attached trains to move. Brunel planned to extend the system all the way from Exeter to Totnes, and by September 1847 it was being operated as far as Newton Abbott. Although the theory was perfectly workable, and the idea was a very sound one, problems developed with the leather flaps. Unfortunately, the 19th century could not provide alternative materials, 
so only a year later the atmospheric system was discontinued and the line was converted to run with steam locomotives. The train's next stop is Totnes, where the tower and pumping station built by Brunel still survive. Totnes is another attractive station, which in the past was proud to have won the coveted award of GWR's Best Kept Station. Closer inspection of Totnes will reveal an uneasy relationship between the mainline station and the very picturesque South Devon Railway, which has in recent years become a very popular tourist attraction. The right-hand side of the station, as this train passes to Plymouth, belongs to the Steam Railway, with the left-hand side belonging to British Rail, as operated by Great Western. Up until the early 1990s, there was no link between the two stations, but the South Devon Railway Trust funded a footbridge, giving passengers convenient access to both sides of the railway, opening on the 30th of September 1993. On today's journey, the identity of Great Western has definitely re-emerged after the many years of British Rail's dubious reputation after the nationalisation of the railways. It may no longer be possible to buy Great Western's own brand of whisky in the buffet car, but in other respects, many of the old GWR principles have been carefully preserved and rejuvenated. A fine example can be found in the instructions given by G. Fines, a past general manager of Paddington, who had some interesting thoughts on how a GWR railwayman should conduct himself in order to provide a more efficient service. Will officers kindly instruct their stations that trains will no longer wait for passengers strolling down a hill or from one platform to another? Will officers kindly instruct their controls not to stop for anyone except the sovereign? Will officers no longer stop trains for themselves? Will the engineers kindly keep off the fast lines during express hours? Will officers get out and about and encourage louder whistles, more noisy slamming of doors and more dramatic waving of flags? And according to Mr Fines, they did. Having reached Totnes 25 minutes before this train is due into Plymouth, the service today is running well on time.
there's little of any note at Plymouth Station. The building is modern, like much of the city, which needed to be almost completely rebuilt after the devastation of the Second World War. The advertising board claiming London as a destination achievable in three hours is about the brightest sign around. It's fascinating to look at the way in which travel has progressed since the early days of the railway. The time given for the journey by coach from Plymouth to London in 1836 was 21 hours and 35 minutes. Brunel, as chief engineer of the Great Western, worked tirelessly to make his railway line as fast as possible. And in 1852, the journey time was cut to a remarkable 7 hours and 5 minutes. 1887 saw the time reduced again to 5 hours and 10 minutes. 1914, 4 hours and 7 minutes. 1939, 4 hours and 5 minutes. 1961, 4 hours dead, until the 3 hour journey was finally achieved in 1985. On a grey, damp day like today, arriving in this decidedly unlovely part of Plymouth, any traveller could be forgiven for being tempted by the promise of a speedy departure. This may be a sad indictment for one of England's greatest historical cities, but a short taxi or bus ride will reveal some of Plymouth's most famous tourist attractions. As a harbour, Plymouth is full of contrasts, with ancient stonework sheltering all types of shipping, ranging from the most traditional of fishing craft to the most technologically advanced ocean-going vessel. The original port, Sudtone, was mentioned in the Doomsday Book of 1086, with today's harbour and sea lock still bearing the name only slightly altered through the centuries to Sutton. Plymouth Hoe has been forever recorded in English history as the site of Sir Francis Drake's now famous game of bowls. The Spanish Armada of 1588 was spotted from this very clear vantage point and Drake reputedly had time to finish his game before rallying his troops to defend the realm. More relevant to Brunel on the grassy hoe is the red and white lighthouse which was transported here after years of service at the Eddystone. This is Smeaton's Tower, designed by John Smeaton, who died just 14 years before Brunel's birth. An innovative engineer, Smeaton was not afraid to go against public opinion with this design, using stone blocks dovetailed together. His critics were proved wrong, as the tower protected many grateful sailors out at the Eddystone for over 100 years. If Brunel had looked for a role model, John Smeaton would have been a fine example, as he was the first person to describe himself as a civil engineer, and went on to found the Society of Civil Engineers in 1771. This whirlwind look at Plymouth may be journey's end for this programme, but it's not the end of the line for the train from Bristol, which will cross the River Tamar by way of the Royal Albert Bridge into Cornwall and on to Penzance. This bridge, which has become as famous as the other great Plymouth landmarks visited, was one of Isambard Kingdom Brunel's last great achievements. As well as being the chief engineer for Great Western, by 1845 Brunel had also taken up the same office for the Cornwall Railway, who had applied to Parliament for an act to extend westward from Plymouth to Falmouth. To achieve this, Brunel would need to cross the River Tamar, and there were two choices, steam ferry to Torpoint or a bridge at Saltash. The government sanctioned a bridge, which the then mature and experienced Brunel was more than happy to take in his stride. Throughout his life, Brunel was a man driven. Today he would undoubtedly have been described as a workaholic. He thought nothing of working an 18-hour day and sleeping in his office or while travelling. 
Brunel was married with a family, but even on his honeymoon, Mary, his new bride, was treated to three days away in Capel Keurig in North Wales, and part of that time was used to visit the opening of the new Liverpool to Manchester railway. If Brunel took holidays, it was usually because his doctor had forced him to for the sake of his health. As a naval town, Plymouth presented Brunel with added difficulties, as the bridge would need to be high enough to allow the Royal Navy's tall ships to pass underneath. Also, when Brunel started to investigate the rock platforms on either side of the river, he found that on the eastern side there was between 3 to 16 feet of mud above it, making his original plan to cross the river with a single span impractical. Brunel settled on two wrought iron spans, with one central river pier for support. As with the Clifton suspension bridge, the cost of building was enormous, and economy meant that Brunel's plan for a double track had to be downsized to a single one, as it still is today. This is somewhat hard to believe given the volume of today's traffic using this line, but advances in modern signalling have at least meant that inconvenience is kept to a minimum. Brunel planned to float the prefabricated spans of the bridge out on the high tide, one at a time, using the rising water to lift them from the shore and using the falling waters to lower them into place on the piers. For the first span, Brunel took charge of the whole operation on the 1st of September 1857. There was no margin for error as the event had aroused so much interest that a public holiday had been declared in Salt Ash. Crowds of people came out to watch as Brunel, using an elaborate system of flag waving, put his plan into action. The tide rose soon after midday and by three o'clock the tide fell, leaving the span positioned perfectly on the piers. It took ten months to build the span to its full height, and as Brunel was by this time heavily committed with the launch of his ship, the Great Eastern, it fell to others to float the second span into position. On the 3rd of May, 1859, the Great Saltash Bridge was officially opened by Prince Albert to scenes of great rejoicing. Sadly, Brunel was not there to see this. His health had deteriorated due to the constant strain of the many projects he had undertaken. For Brunel, this was extremely distressing. Naturally, he wanted to see the results of his labours. The Cornwall Railway, in gratitude for his efforts, prepared a special wagon in which Brunel could lie on a couch and be drawn over the majestic spans of his Royal Albert Bridge. It was just months after this that Brunel collapsed and died. He was 53 years of age. Today's journey, nearly 150 years after Brunel's death, is a more fitting tribute to his great skill than anything that could have been said in his own lifetime. The Clifton Suspension Bridge still takes people safely over the Avon Gorge. The SS Great Britain still gleams in Bristol docks. And the Royal Albert Bridge still carries trains in and out of Cornwall. Brunel's work has stood the test of time and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future.